Is that okay for me? So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and the only reason I'm using this is because I'm recording it, and it's easier for the camera to pick up my voice with the microphone. So I know I can talk to you guys very easily. It also saves some of my voice too, so I'm not having to talk as loud as I might have to. Uh, so welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm always interested to see the turnout. Uh, you know, if you do have to see your friends, please tell them these are important events. I know that things are happening often, and people have many different commitments. But I think these are valuable things that you guys uh, can get some information. You know, some of it might not be applicable to you, or you might know it. But there's a lot of information that you know might be underlying that you you might have questions about. So um, encourage your friends, fellow parents, um, to attend if possible. Share some of the resources that you learn here today. And um, you know, I'm more than happy to take take questions. Feel free to stop me as we're going. Um, I might. You know, just say, please hold on, I'll finish this thought and then I'll answer your question. But if you guys do have questions, I'm more than happy to answer any of them. And same thing with you guys. So I'm glad you guys are here. I always like to see students. Um, and for future reference, these things are not required that students are here. But if you guys are making a choice between staying home, playing video games, and coming, this is a much better choice. Okay? Uh, so my name is Jeffrey. Uh, I'm looking around. I see most people that I know or I've met before. Um, I am the counselor here. And I'm kind of one of three uh, office team members, I guess, myself, uh, Kristen Lee, the vice principal, and Joanna Mitchell, the principal. So um, I do these things every year in the beginning of the year for each grade level. I do combine the ninth and 10th grade, uh, mostly because it's a very similar type of grade um, level for both. There's a few differences that I'll distinguish as we're going through. but. Uh, and, and uh, so, you know, but a lot of it is, is kind of the same track. A lot of it is academics, a lot of it is career. A lot of it is just start thinking about stuff like college. And so, you know, listen up for when I say, you know, this is a 10th grade thing, this is a freshman thing. You know, that's, that's going to kind of be our difference. But a lot of it is kind of an overarching experience in terms of our underclass. Um, if you guys don't have my information, it'd be really handy. The easiest way to get a hold of me is through my email, typically. Um, I'm able to answer emails in between meetings, in between um, crises and counseling appointments and different things like that. So please, you know, write that down. Um, it's also located on the website. The website has all of this information. I will be posting this to YouTube. I will be posting the, the PDF of this presentation to that video. So if you know people aren't here, please also tell them to watch the video on YouTube, and there'll be a link going out. Um, and I'll get to a little, few more communication pieces in a few minutes. Um, my phone number is up there too. That's my direct line. 7,000 if you know is the line to their general office, but that goes straight to my phone. And again, I usually get to phone calls in the afternoon just because I'm able to sit down, kids are out of the school, and I'm able to pick up the phone and have a more serious conversation on the phone. So what are we going to do tonight? Um, so tonight we're going to be kind of giving you a broad overview. A lot of this will be covering a lot of different things. Um, at a semi-surface level. So we're not going to get too, too in-depth into any one thing. We'll go a little bit deeper into things like the A through G requirements. The, those are like high school or the CSU and UC college entrance requirements. But overall, it's going to be, if, if I went in-depth, we'd have four of these meetings a month probably, and they'd still be the same amount of time. So I think I'm going to do a, a, a kind of a broad overview, open it, and then I'll provide questions if you want more information, or this is a great segue into an appointment to talk about things that you might want some more information about. Um, we'll talk about some common problems that freshmen and sophomores typically, typically come up against. What do we normally see? Uh, talk about the A through G like I mentioned. We'll give you guys both a 10th and 9th grade overview, what the, what the year looks like. What are some big milestones we need to make? We'll also talk about testing. I'll go through a little bit of the plan, the PSAT, the SAT, the ACT, all kinds of acronyms. Uh, it's never too early to start for college. I'm also going to touch on uh, one of our big focuses this year called the one to two. And who's seen those signs around school? If you've been around, big, well, not super big. I'm going to make a giant one. 
but a, a bright blue sign. I'll touch based on what that means, why we're doing that, and what it means to you guys. Okay. All right. So, so how do you get my help? Um, so I am the only school counselor here. Um, unfortunately, I wish I had a partner. And this year, I actually do kind of have a partner part time. So I, I am supervising an intern. Um, her name is Danielle Adler. Some of you may actually know her. She worked here a few years back um, before she had her credential and everything, and now is back going through her credentialing process and um, working with me. So she may be meeting with some of your students. Uh, I can promise you she's a great counselor. I will not let her do anything that I would not do myself. Um, and she will be a great resource and double our efforts in terms of counseling and meeting with students regularly. Uh, and she, you know, if you're interested in her email or if you want to meet with her or something like that, that's totally cool. I really want her to get, a, get the counseling experience of everything. So if you're an upset parent or you're a happy parent, I want her to experience and troubleshoot and problem solve. So uh, sometimes I might ask you, how would you like to meet with Danielle Adler? Like, would that be okay with you? And if you're okay with that, that would be a great experience for her. And, you know, I'm more than happy to meet with you afterwards. I can answer any questions you felt like you maybe were uncomfortable about how she answered. And then that also lets me teach her. Um, so, I usually run things through appointments um, for any meetings that are longer than about 15 minutes. Strictly because it lets me kind of organize my day ahead of time, if at all possible. I know things come up and I know things happen. And I know that... Um, you know, walk-ins I'm totally okay with, as long as we're also okay with, like, just knowing that I might already have an appointment scheduled or I might be busy around the office. So appointments are a great way to make sure that I'm dedicating time to you, and then it also helps me kind of be pretty efficient with my time as well. The appointment system that I typically use uh, is through an online software portal, so it's called uh, Schedule Once, and there's a link on the North Tahoe High School website. Who's been to our website? Great. That is a huge resource. A lot of information that I do is electronic. I don't really mail out stuff. I don't do a whole lot of flyers to students. One, to save the planet, kind of. And two, because it, it takes a lot of time to prepare that stuff, and writing an email or a newsletter, that kind of stuff, is much quicker. It's able to reach a much broader audience. Um, so you know, every once in a while, I will send out invitations to things like RTI and that kind of thing. But typically, email, newsletters, which I'll show you how to get on. Those are my main sources of information down to you guys. Um, and I always encourage you to ask questions. I, the, the saying there is no stupid question is a very valid question, a very valid statement. Like, I don't think there's a stupid question. Um, so if you have a concern, an issue, um, I, I'd love to know about it. I'd love to help you address it, help solve the problem. Um, and please do, do do tell us as it's happening. Don't let it get, you know, really deep. Don't let it become a major issue until um, you tell us, because then it becomes much more difficult for us to address. So, if there's a small thing that you have a problem with, we'd much rather hear about it, see if we can address it, and solve it before it grows. All right. So this is the website. This is an older screenshot, but it looks very much the same. It's kind of small. I don't know, my computer. Uh, so I am a very technological person, and I don't even know how to do this one. Um, so this area, this red up here, this little blurry thing, that is like the counseling mecca. That's where a lot of information goes. That's where you want to go to find information about. Uh, there's there's a further page that's all counseling links. It's got information from NCAA to scholarships to college entrance. All that stuff is available to you up there. There's the newsletter sign up. I highly just suggest everyone go home and do that this evening. If you're not signed up for it, please do that. I don't spam you, I promise. It's like maybe once a week, possibly. Um, and it's all good stuff. I don't, I don't want to waste your time without good need. Um, there's also information, like I just started this year, a counseling blog with articles that I find from around all over the place that pertain from freshman information to senior information, college acceptance to financial aid, essay writing, study skills, homework, all that stuff. So there's just full articles up there that you guys can read on topics that you're concerned about, that you want to know about. Um, there's information about like other social media outlets. I have Facebook, I have Twitter, I have Google+. Um, there's a whole bunch of information 
available to you. So I encourage you to take a look at that and just check it out. Um, that's the general page. So once you click on that link on the left-hand side, the first screenshot takes you to the next page that has a bunch of information like my contact information. The YouTube page, there's tutorials on there about how to register, how to use Naviance. Like I'm constantly trying to upload new things so that you guys can train yourself and, and access that from home or help a student with that through YouTube or whatever else resource we have. And then this last screenshot is all the way down at the bottom. So if you're looking for links, they're all scroll all the way down. And there's links after links after links with good resources that you guys can utilize. I do my best to keep that updated. Usually happens like maybe three times a year. I'll go through and make sure everything's working and add new stuff, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna quickly go over just some expectations. Um, and I don't say this to make you feel like it's a bad thing, but I just wanna make sure that we have realistic expectations because this is a relationship. So me as a counselor, you guys as a student, and you guys as parents, we have to work together. And we have to work together positively and proactively. And one, some ways to do that um, typically involve like a professional real, you know, relationship. So some of the things that um, you know, I expect as a counselor is that, you know, again, that communication piece. I really love parent communication. I feel like when I'm communicating with a parent, there's many, much, much less questions, much less issue comes up. Students are more successful. So don't hesitate to email. The other thing is like, the other side of the coin is that, you know, I do have a wife and a dog, and um, I, t I sometimes will answer my emails from home just because it's easier for me. They're coming into 50 emails, they can take care of a few of them on my downtime. But typically, like, I'm, my office hours are usually from about 7 to 4. So if you catch me in those hours, you know, I usually will try to get back to your phone calls pretty quickly, my emails pretty quickly, um, and, and so on. So as long as we're kind of staying with it, you know, have some of those professional boundaries, we're going to work together really well. And, you know, I want to respect your time, I want, you, I want to respect your space, your family, like your, your valuable time. And the only thing that I ask is the you know, same kind of counter-respect turn to my family, too. So as long as that, that's, that's all the norms we have to go over. Um, so for you guys, though, as parents, one of the big things as a freshman, as a parent, as a student, you know, this high school thing is brand new for some of you guys. Some of you guys are sophomore parents or sophomores. It's still probably a little new. And you guys are going to be great mentors to the younger kids, you're going to be great resources for the freshman parents because you just did it. You can say, this worked, this didn't. This helped, this didn't really do so much. And so freshman parents, don't be afraid. And before you leave here, get some names of people that are in different grades than you to have as a resource. You guys are a community, and you know if, if, if you guys can help each other, that's one less, like, that's one more support system that we have in place, okay? Um, Start talking now with your student. As a parent, students, you guys can kind of tune this out a little bit. Parents, start talking now about college. Start talking now about careers. Because believe it or not, many students make a decision the first day they walk in this, into the high school, I'm going to be a good student or I'm going to be a bad student. And really within the first couple months of high school, there's a tone that is set with a student. And sometimes they can set pretty negative tone and fix it. Sometimes they set a very positive tone and mess it up. But what is most typical is that if they set a negative tone, they might increase a little bit, but a lot of times they can sabotage some of their possibilities for their future. So it's really important that we, as a system of support for students, and this is for you guys too, when you guys are in classes, the stuff that you do now affects graduation, it affects college entrance, it affects how much money you make. It affects what job you get. So no pressure, but it's it's a big deal. And so you know, if you're choosing Call of Duty over English homework, you know that's that's a choice that you know you're up to your family, your, yourself. But just know that it's not going to pay off later necessarily. It might hurt some chances for future success. Okay. So the thing, you know, high school graduation seems a long ways away. It will go by in a flash. So we're making good choices, utilizing our resources together, okay? Set up meetings with me on a pretty regular basis. I'm not talking like every week, but like, you know, 
once a semester or three times a year, that type of thing, to just purposefully sit down, look at what the plan is for your son or daughter, set up, I would love to meet with every parent to set up what's called a four-year plan or three-year plan for your sophomores to go over, okay, these are the classes we're taking this year. What does next year possibly look like? What is our next step? What should we be doing? And this thing could be as, as short as 30 minutes, and we can sit down and have a pretty good idea of where we're going, where we've been, and what some plans are. Okay? I see some pretty wide open eyes. Is this, is this overwhelming yet? Okay. Um, so students, so parents, you know, you guys are kind of like the cheerleaders. You're the, the mother hen kind of making sure things are hap happening, but you're not doing things for them. You are not, you're not an enabler. You are a supporter. So you're able to come in when needed, offer support. But high school is a learning opportunity for a student to become an adult. If they don't have these skills by the time they graduate, and, and it's definitely progress. So it's, it's a, you know, freshmen, they have this much. Seniors, they should have this much. As adults, they have this much. So it's definitely a learning progress, but it's something that starts freshman, sophomore year. And that starts with some responsibility. So that might mean you step it back a little bit if you're kind of the, you know, looking over the shoulder and making sure stuff's happening. And let them do it, because it's okay to fail. Don't get me wrong. I want to see A's. I've just read several studies about failure. And typically, failure leads to greater success if you learn from it. And so, a C, you guys are going to get progress reports pretty soon. I've seen grades. C's now are not a terrible, terrible thing. Okay? It might not be what you expect for your student. It might not be what you want. But this is, I mean, it's like six, seven weeks in. High school's hard. It's supposed to be. So it's a learning process that we're going through. So if you're starting with a C, that's great. We have a great goal to set for that A or whatever expectations are for the project, for the semester or the next progress report that we can work on getting to. So it is a great learning opportunity as freshmen, as sophomores, to learn how to be a good student. Because it's, it's a whole different ballgame in middle school. Students. Uh, deadlines are important, okay? So I'm gonna drill this into your head every single year, every single meeting. I'm gonna remind you guys, deadlines matter. Why? Because they actually do, okay? And I'm kind of a stickler for deadlines. So, um, you know, if I say PSAT, PSAT money and registration is October 17th, PSAT deadlines are October 17th. And I usually set them because I have to order the test the next day, for example. And a lot of times in our area, in our small school setting, there's a lot of flexibility that happens. You know, there's teachers that take late work or things that go through and we're able to, to make it work. And sometimes it's, it's not. And so it'll, it'll serve you super in life, getting used to the idea of turning things in by the deadline or registering or asking for permission, that kind of thing. Okay, so just pay attention and start a calendar. And then finally, create good relationships with teachers. So in two, three, four years, you're going to be wanting letters of recommendation. You're going to be wanting support, help from teachers at this school for college applications, for scholarships, what be it. Okay. If you don't have a relationship established with a teacher, or myself, or Ms. Mitchell, or Ms. Lee, or some several people here on campus, it's going to become much harder to find someone that, one, will write you a letter, and two, will write you an actually good letter. So there's, there's a major difference between the two of those. I can write anybody a letter. But college admissions, financial aid people, they read right through a lot of that stuff if it's not very personal. They say, oh, this kid didn't really take a whole lot of time to get to know anybody at the high school. So it's really important that you establish a relationship Build things with parent, with the teachers. Believe it or not, teachers don't not like you guys. <laughs> They're not here to torture you with homework or busy work. Trust me, they'd much rather do like more meaningful stuff too. Sometimes it's a balancing act though. And so, you know, it's 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 an opportunity for you guys to become mature students, to become mature young adults, and start those relationship processes with teachers. An easy way to do that is, you know, pay attention in class. Instead of having your phone out doing Angry Birds or something, you know, listen to what the teacher's saying. 
And that shows the teacher that you're invested in your education and that you're really wanting to learn from them and you're supporting them as a teacher. And don't be afraid to ask them for help either. They're just as available. They're kind of a, you know, some of them are scary, but they're all here to help. They wouldn't be, you know, they're not doing this to get rich. They're doing this because they like helping kids. And so don't be afraid, you guys, to go up and ask them for help. All right, so what are some common problems that I've seen and that typically will come up for freshmen? You can kind of extend this to sophomores too, because it's kind of, you guys are kind of in that learning process of maturing to some young adulthood, still learning how to become a good student, managing stuff on your own, okay? A lot of times we see what I like to call the lack of future consequences, or LFC. So, like I said, a lot of kids think high school is this distant, thing that's happening someday. And nothing that I, you know, I can slack off my classes and nothing really happens. No consequences will come. And, you know, some certain circumstances, no consequences may come at you. You can fail certain classes, have no consequences happen other than a worse GPA, and move on to the next level of high school. You know, retake a different art class or something. But as you get higher and higher in your education, you find out that these little classes, these little projects, these little programs that you're in stack up and really affect certain things like, can I go to Harvard or can I go to Chico? And, and so there's a big difference there. So being able to focus and, and, and start setting goals now, it allows us to see some of those possible consequences that can affect some of those goals that we might have set up. And I can help any of you guys with setting up some of those goals. I'm also working with some of your Pathways classes to make sure that their teachers are also working with you guys to set up realistic, attainable goals for this year, for your single class. The goal is for you guys. It's not for parents. It's not for me. You know, I, I like to see people with goals, but you know, whether or not you attain a goal should be something that you're motivated. And, you know, that's a learning process as well. But it's a very important step to take in terms of, like, becoming a you know, full-fledged high school student. And again, avoiding talking to school staff. A lot of people will come to me and say, I don't want to go talk to such and such a teacher. They scare me or um, they're mean, they don't listen to me, that kind of thing. Try to avoid that. I know it's scary sometimes and it's intimidating. Some people are you know, a little bit more activity than others, but they're an adult that you might not necessarily know, especially if you're a freshman. You're in a new class, you're in a whole new environment, but do your best as a student, do your best as a parent to encourage students to go talk to the teachers for themselves. A lot of times as parents, we want to step in and email the teacher or ask the questions, and that's really taking the experience away from the student. You're stealing their epiphany. Okay, so you're, you're taking that, that learning opportunity, sometimes because we want to get an answer quickly or we have certain things we want to ask, and that's fine, definitely contact a teacher, but ask your student, encourage your student to also make contact with that teacher for some of those same issues, because that really teaches them how to interact with staff, teaches them how to ask questions, how to get information that they need in, in, a, in a very respectful, kind of schooly way, so it's a very, very good benefit. Uh, the last bullet, creating academic homes. This is one of the most prominent things that I see uh, with underclassmen. Typically, students will come in, and typically freshmen, not to beat down on you guys, but you guys are typically somewhat immature students coming from the middle school. Okay, So you guys are used to a little bit more support, maybe a little bit more hand-holding in the classroom. And there's still a lot of support in the classroom for you guys, but there's much less. It's kind of like a big step up in the responsibility level, stepping on this campus. And sometimes the grades will reflect that. So I don't want you guys to freak out when you see their progress reports and biology grades. Biology is one of our hardest classes. Why would we give it to freshmen? I'm not sure. We're figuring that out. But it is a very challenging class. It's designed for freshmen, but it, it is a very... It's making kids step up to that level of expectation. And sometimes it takes longer than like the first progress report for that to happen. Okay. 
So just know that, you know, like for, for example, get to the A through G requirements. English. You need four years of English to go to any four-year school. I won't say most four-year schools. There's one or two out there probably that you wouldn't need all four years, but typically you need all four years. Okay? And typically you need all four years with a C minus or better. So you get a D in freshman English nine for your semester grade in January. You're retaking that class if you want to go to CSU Chico, if you want to go to UC Berkeley. If you want to go to Stanford, Harvard, any of those schools, you've got to have a better grade than that. So don't do that to yourself. You create these holes that are hard to get out of. And so it's easier to put in the work now than worry about it later. Okay? Deal? Let me fix this screen. It's too hard to see. So essentially what this is, so we're going to start talking about the A through G requirements, which for some of you guys that just walked in, that is the, what we call the A through G. There's how many letters are this? Categories that um, are broken down by subjects that are required minimum entrance requirements for the California State University System, the CSU, and the University of California System, the UC system. Okay, that is typically the system that we, that I, say we like if there's more of me, that I advise to when I'm advising a student in terms of college admissions. Unless you tell me I really want to go to UNR. Like, UNR is slightly different, but typically the A through G requirements meet pretty much every other system's entrance requirements. Things like Harvard or Stanford are going to have a higher level of expectations, but the minimum classes that you take are pretty similar. Okay? So this is a big thing that you can, I have some of these in the front office, like actual papers that you can print out. I didn't bring them out here. Uh, but it's a handy thing that you can see what the comparisons are. The CSU and UCs are a little bit different. Slightly, but not a lot. Um, they all have the same basic requirements, but there's a few technicality differences within each. And the technic technicalities rarely ever come up, so we just kind of address them as the same. All right, so I'm just going to go through quickly. I'm not going to go too in-depth into the, you know, basically for the next couple slides. The top up there, that's the number of years that we need to have. Okay, the next level is... Um, the grade requirements, and then what classes we actually offer, and this is as of this year, the classes do change year to year um, to a certain extent. These are the classes we offer at our high school to fill these requirements. Okay? So for example, A, you need two years of history. We, we require three, so you're, you're, you're fine. So if you're graduating from our high school, you're as long so technicality. You can pass our classes with a D. Okay, you get credits at North Tahoe High School and Tahoe Truckee Unified District with a D minus or better. Do I agree with that? Not necessarily. But that's how it is. So if you get a D minus, you pass world history, for example. But if you look up there, you must pass with a C, C minus count. So that's a C. C or better to get credit for college. So sometimes people will have, get confused that I passed this class, I got the credits. But yeah, you passed with a D plus. So that's great, you can graduate high school with that credit, but you don't get college entrance credit for that credit. Does that make sense? So sometimes people get confused when they see that. Um, so that's why it's important that we, we're looking at our grades and that, you know, even semesters. So we are on a semester system here, five credits in January, five credits in June for every one of your classes except for pathways. Your grades, if you get a D January and an A June in almost all of the classes, you need to retake the first semester of that class to bring that grade up. So I won't say too much more about the grading stuff because it's more of an individual basis. Um, but just know, like if you're getting Ds, that's something you might want to come talk to me about pretty quick so we can set up that plan for you. So we need two years of history. We're covered with that as long as you're passing with a C or better in our high school graduation requirements. You need four years of English. Again, covered in our high school graduation requirements, passing with a C minus or better, and it's good for college. As always, honors, AP, colleges love to see that better than the other ones. I get some questions about, should I take regular and get an A, or AP and get a B? And there's not necessarily a black and white answer for that. 
there's positive and negative scenarios. Schools can look at, I mean, schools do their own thing. And every school is a little bit different. So when schools look at, say, you know, you took AP English language versus AP 11, they might like to see that you're challenging yourself, you're stepping up to a certain level by taking an AP class, and weigh that into that B grade. And the AP classes are weighted. So essentially, in terms of GPA, you got the same grade. So, you know, you don't get extra GPA points by having an A and getting five out of four. You're basically getting four by a B in an AP class and a four A in a regular class. Does anybody, know, does anybody not know how, I should ask this first, anybody not know how GPA works? Does ever, who, uh, who needs further explanation about GPA? It's okay if you do, I'm happy to explain shortly. Okay, so GPA, so we're on the A through F scale, right? A, when we calculate it, each, each letter grade by a semester gets assigned a certain number value. For example, an A is a four, B is a three, C is a two, D is a one, F is a zero, okay? AP classes, for example, and college level classes, they're like a step up one, so an A is a five. That's how you get like a 4.2 GPA. Okay, so it has a higher value to that level because it's a harder class. Essentially, we, we add those values up for each of your classes. We divide by the number of classes that you've taken. So like for freshmen, it'll be at a six probably for this year, and that's your GPA. And as you keep going, you have more classes added up, more numbers added, so that's how your GPA kind of go through 3.3, 3.1, all that kind of stuff. So that's in a nutshell how GPA works. Uh, Question, good. Is your first semester GPA um, calculated with your second semester GPA for a final GPA? So on your, I'll, I'll show you blurrily a example of a transcript of where different things are. For some of your freshmen, it's going to look different than the junior high one probably. Um, but the question was for people in the video. Um, do, do you calculate your first semester's GPA into the second one for like a final year GPA? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, so on a transcript you see, I'll show you in the bottom, bottom portion of it, it'll have GPAs from your entire high school career. So it, every time you have a new grade, it updates. So it'll be like a, a, a cumulative GPA, you would say, your total academic, total weighted, that kind of stuff. And then underneath each little section, so you have spring semester, fall semester, that kind of thing. Underneath there, it'll have the individual GPAs from that term alone. So each term will have their own GPA that you'll see, and it'll stay there, so it'll keep calculating. And then at the bottom, that's the one that gets updated every time the grading process goes through. Answer your question? Okay. So four years of English, I will address honors very quickly. So honors is not weighted like an AP class. Honors is denoted on a transcript with an H-O-N, and that is the only difference. Okay. It, it does look a little bit better for colleges, but the way that we like to explain it is that it is a pre-AP class, okay? You are preparing yourself for an AP level work. And it moves through more curriculum, it moves at a faster pace. Students that don't take honors typically are not as well prepared when they get to their 11th and 12th grade AP English classes, if they so choose. Students in honors do not have to take AP. Regular students can take AP. Okay, when I say regular, like it's bad, it's not bad. Okay, regular is a great class, it's a great curriculum. Honors is just a little bit kind of faster paced. It goes through a little bit more curriculum throughout the year. Okay, but really, so I, I, I would like to wait. If I had my choice, I would wait them slightly. I wouldn't wait them as much as an AP class, but I, there's gotta be a little bit of incentive, right? So the incentive for you guys, if you're in honors, is that you are preparing yourself, you are investing in being successful at an AP level. Okay, so all that stress, all that paper writing, it's going to pay off. Math. So we have three years required. That little grade four is basically almost required. It's recommended. If you're going to any type of uh, really competitive, you know, Berkeley, something like that, four years, you better have four years of math. It's going to be unlikely for you to get in with three years of math. Especially if you're going into something like engineering or computer science or anything like that. Math, any math kind of heavy, heavy, heavy majors, 
four years. So just plan on it. If you're starting in uh, geometry, typically you'll go up through AP calculus. Starting in algebra, you'll go up through pre-calculus. There's different ways to kind of jump a level if you're like wanting to go through AP calculus in high school. We can talk about that. Um, again, C minus or better. Your courses have to include algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. So no matter what grade level you're going through, you have to go up through minimum algebra two. So if they, if they took algebra one in eighth grade, that's considered part of Yes, okay. so when you apply, you self-report any eighth grade classes. So if you took algebra one in eighth grade and you passed, you self-report that you passed. And essentially, you're, you're gonna go way beyond. If you're starting in geometry, most likely you're gonna go beyond that because we require three years at the high school. So typically, if you're in geometry, you're able to get further, so your requirements are met and beyond. Yeah. Um, if you took algebra one and geometry in middle school, and then you take three years of, say, algebra two, pre-calc, and calculus here, is there a fourth year you could take here? So there's, there's some online possibilities for like a higher level of calculus. The, the main thing that I suggest is statistics. So continuing on to like, Sierra College has statistics, things like online classes have statistics. You're not gonna find anything here that we offer or through cold stream or anything like that. It's either gonna be through the community college or it's gonna be an online provider. Um, just because we don't usually see very many students being above calculus. And if they do, they're like, I'm done with math and over it. So the fourth year definitely recommended. Um, so lab science. Okay, so lab is an important piece. So there's a distinguished, um, and it kind of, it varies a little bit, but in a nutshell, a lab science is something like biology, chemistry, physics, okay, a, a science where there, or a science where there's a lab component. Some people, you know, we have to start in AP psychology. AP psychology is not a lab science. Okay, that's a college prep elective, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, so those are the different things. The AP brackets means there's a regular and a, a non-AP and an AP option available. Uh, and again, these the science breadth is the one that varies the most from year to year. And it's really based on student interest. So when I come around in the spring and do student course requests, if 30 kids want AP Bio, if five kids want AP Chemistry, we're having Bio. So you know sometimes there's some choices that have to happen in terms of like what we're able to offer. If you really are set on Chemistry, AP Chemistry, there's it's usually like a sequence, or like we'll have bio one year, chemistry another, because you know the kids have already taken bio, so they want to go into chemistry. But it really does vary. So LOAT, language other than English. Um, so you need two years minimum of the same language. That's very important distinguishing piece. Some people will take French and Spanish, one year each. Doesn't fulfill your requirement. Unless you're like taking like French 5 and Spanish 5. So that's a whole other thing called validation. But essentially you need two years minimum. Three years is recommended. If you start like, some students are like an immersion program that started at like Spanish level 3. That, by passing Spanish level 3, they fulfill the previous two years. That's validation. And it's very specific. There's a lot of other things that go along with it, but in a, you know, basically that's how it works. So we have one student this year taking AP Spanish out of the goodness of our Spanish, or I'm Spanish 4, Spanish 4. Um, I'm just talking about Spanish 4. So if you want to take four years of Spanish, you're not in AP, you didn't start, or you're not in the immersion program, uh, that's not available apparently? It is. It depends on how many students it's, we have that need Spanish 4. For, for this, in this certain instance, there is one student that needed Spanish 4. We can't make a class of one student. It is. If, 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 if non-emergent kids decide to take four years of Spanish, it just depends on the number of students. And usually there's another option around that, that system. You know, for example, this student, we were able to work with the teacher. She's offering it in kind of a blended method within another class. 
So he's, that student is still taking Spanish 4. They're getting the information. They're getting the same stuff at a normal Spanish 4. Mm -hmm. But because of the low numbers, we had to find a creative solution to make sure that that student was getting the class that they need. But we can't, we can't justify spending X amount of dollars on a teacher to teach one section for one student. So, so do we typically not have four years of Spanish? If you start as a freshman and go three to four years, do you not get one, two, three, and four? When you're a senior, do you get four Spanish four? Typically, so the most typically typical progression is Spanish. If you're not a, a non-emergent student, is Spanish one, two, three, AP Spanish. So ninth, tenth, eleventh, oh, AP Spanish. So there is no Spanish for? There is. There is Spanish for offered. Most students choose to go to AP Spanish. Oh, okay. Are they prepared? They are not on the emergency. Most of them are pretty successful at the AP Spanish test. After the year. By the end of the year. Oh, that's a better way to go. So, I mean, Spanish for is definitely an option, and we offer it, but typically it's much less desirable, much less, I mean, it's almost the same class. Okay. AP Spanish language, and there's two AP levels, so AP Spanish language and literature. So, and, and this, so language is definitely one that varies by enrollment, interest, that kind of thing. Like, it, this year we couldn't do AP Literature because there was only like two kids that actually wanted it. So, we try to find alternatives that they can access that will get their need, but also meet our need of not, we can't make a teacher available for that. So, there is Spanish board, it's an option. Most students elect to continue on to AP Spanish. That's tip. I mean, it's, it's a great option. Most students are very successful with that option. Um, they get the extra GPA points, look straight at college, pass the test, and get college credit for Spanish. Like, there's tons of benefits. Um, some students, it's not for them, and that's fine. Um, and the teachers are very good at letting you know this student should probably not be in AP Spanish language. They are more of a Spanish forfeit. And then we have to brainstorm if we're not able to offer Spanish for and figure it out. But it's not like we just say no Spanish for. And everyone else is kind of out to the wind because there's not a Spanish floor. We try to definitely make it fit for everybody as much as possible. Occasionally, there's a situation where we just can't work it out. And so we have to try to find an alternative method to get that if you're interested in that class. And sometimes there will be classes that we want that we not, can't necessarily get, either for a scheduling conflict during the same period, or you know, it's just not able to be offered at our school this year. Or anymore or any you know sometimes classes don't come back because a teacher has left or you know we had different needs come up at our high school. So that kind of yeah. clears it up a little bit. Okay. Good questions. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. Um, VPA. Um, so you need one year of a visual performing arts. And again this is a full year requirement. Not really a problem anymore here since we're on a full year schedule. Um, so, you know, art, ceramics, photo, band, uh, jazz band, jazz ensemble, I would kind of, you know, that's questionable. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a zero, so like jazz band, it's a zero credit class. Schools sometimes won't take that, but if typically if you're in jazz band, you've taken regular band, then you're, you're fine. Uh, but I put those up there just because those are musical options for you. And then finally, this is the G, the last section, college prep elective. What that means is essentially anything from any of those previous things or any of these other classes that kind of fit in that area. So economics is actually a college prep elective, the second half of that government econ combo your senior year. Physical science, if you took earth science, I don't think any of you guys are here for earth science. Uh, psychology, those are all college prep electives. So there's only one year required. Anything else above that is kind of icing on the cake. Any questions about the A through G requirements at this point? If you think of them later, feel free to ask me, but before we move on. Where does the technology class fit in? Uh, tech is a vocational requirement, so that's a high school requirement. So um, in terms of high school graduation, very similar, a little bit less. Um, I don't know why I didn't include that, sorry. Um, there is a vocational technical requirement in our high school. So we have now three vocational technical electives, uh, or we'll, we'll sometimes you'll hear it vote. And so we have culinary class, or cooking classes, there's three levels of culinary. We have our engineering technology, there's three levels of engineering that you can take. 
when we have a new tech class with uh, these guys up here who are running the sound and the lights, making sure that I can talk through this microphone. That's a class that students can take. All of those count for your vocational. You need one year of the vocational class to graduate. So everyone will take culinary, everyone will take engineering, or that tech elective class by the time they graduate, or any other class that we decide that we're able to offer in the future um, if, if we haven't done it by that time. Yes? Sorry, I might have missed this, but is vocational the same as college prep? No. Vocational classes are not A through G. So A through G classes are, are specific to this because they go through an approval process. Same thing with AP classes. We submit every year a list of our college classes with our syllabus, our teachers, what their assignments are, that kind of stuff. The UC system goes through it and pro pro or processes it, decides this class is a adequate level class for us to accept for this, this requirement, and they approve it. If you're curious about what class that it's on a website that's accessible to anybody, I can share the link if you're curious. Um, if you email me or something. Um, but essentially, not all classes are qualified for that system. So it's not a college prep class. So, you know, a vocational technical class is a life skills type class that we have as a district as a requirement. We find value in learning not only about college based materials, but learning how to cook or learning how to repair your, you know, your robot or something. Um, <laughs> Or run a soundboard, like that kind of thing. So there's a value to taking those classes. And they're usually a much more fun class. You're able to get hands on with stuff. It's a more explorative, exploratory type of class where you're diving into stuff that you don't really usually have access to. A lot of cooks who have graduated have gone through a cooking program and found out that they, they, love, they love cooking through that class. Same thing with some of those engineering tech classes. They find out, I love working with wood and, you know, I want to be an engineer. Like those classes are developing students. And so it might not necessarily be a college prep class, but it's a very beneficial class at a high school. And usually some of our most favorite classes. Answer that question? Okay. Yes. One more question I'm going to move on so we can get through and then I'll ask you to save some for the end. That way I don't keep anyone here that doesn't want to listen. Uh, I don't know if you're going to cover this, but I'm noticing a lot of people are taking Sierra College courses that transfer and that starts before your junior year? Are you going to touch on that? Or I can touch on that towards the end. Liaison? Okay. Um, if I don't, remind me. Okay. Okay? So I'm going to have a lot to think about between you and then. Um, Which point, where does PE fall in the office? So again, PE is the same type of thing. So there's so these are specifically to college entrance requirements. PE is not a college prep class. PE is a high school state mandated required class that every student has to take. Same thing with health. So, it, so there are certain classes that you see in your high school transcript that you have to take that are strictly high school graduation requirements. You don't pass this class, you don't take this class, you don't need to get a diploma. And most of those are state mandated things, like you have to have X amount of hours of PE and health and this kind of stuff. So one more question that I gotta go on. Please write it down and, re and I'll take quite more questions at the end, that way I can dismiss people if they really don't wanna hang out. Um, I saw I heard you first, sorry. Can you give an example of a physical Physical, physical science. That's the class. Yeah, we do. So physical science is the class. So it, it's called physical science. It's more of a... So it's it meets our physical science graduation requirement. So sometimes people have trouble with things like chemistry or physics. Those are college prep classes in, term, in lab science area. Some people have a little bit more trouble in that class. And they're maybe not necessarily on this college track. They've you know gotten self gotten themselves in that hole that they can't really dig themselves out of. Um, so they take it's it's almost it's not remedial, it's a different approach to a physical science type class, and so it, it's called physical science, and it's a great class. It's, it's a whole different thing. Um, it just doesn't meet the requirements of a lab science class to be included in that. So that it, it, if you're looking for it, it's called physical science. That's the name of the class. Okay, so please write down the question. I will take it. I promise. All right, freshman overview. So again, your number one job as a freshman is being a great student. You're not a, so you're not a good athlete. You are probably a good athlete, but you're, that's not your number one goal. Your number one goal is being the best student that you can be. Being good at your homework, being good at getting stuff in on time, working with teachers, studying, reading your books, that kind of thing. 
A lot of people tend to get things skewed to where you are an athlete student and not a student athlete. Because I guarantee you, if you are not a student athlete, you will probably not be eligible to be that athlete. Things have changed in terms of like NIAA. You, some, some students can do that, but it can get, it become hard. It can become ineligible. So new rules starting this year now with this progress report, 2.0 or and 1F makes you ineligible until you get that F up and then until the next following week. So it's really important to, if you want to play sports, and that's, that's not even our rule, that's a rule set, set forth by the sport group. Um, so it's really important you guys stay on top of your grades. I say it and say it again, I'll remind you and remind you again, your number one job is being a student. Okay? You will thank me later, but that really is kind of why you're here right now. Don't focus in necessarily so much on the grades. This is kind of like a, a somewhat strange concept to a lot of people. And so I'm going to take 30 seconds to explain it. Grades are an important way of determining someone's ability in a certain subject. And they matter in life and in grades and or in school and in college applications and all this stuff. So don't not hear that part. <coughs> But grades are not an end-all, if all thing. The most important thing that your student can do is put 100% of their effort forward. And if they get a B doing that, I'm completely happy. I'm 100% happy if they are trying their very hardest, challenging themselves in their classes, and they get a B, I will pat them on the back and say, good job. You guys might have a different expectation. That's my expectation. Because high school is a hard thing. It takes learning. It take, if you're getting A's, my question is, what else can we do to make this harder? Because that's telling me, you, maybe you're not challenged enough. Maybe you don't have enough challenge in your, in your schooling. A's are something to be attained through struggle, through work, and hard, and, 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 and ethic, and stuff like that. It's not something that should automatically be expected. So if we come home with a B or a C, hopefully not these refs. I, I kind of frown upon these refs. They're not too good. You know, A through C, that shows me there's room for improvement. That shows me that maybe we're not trying our hardest, or we are, and we're not utilizing some of our resources very effectively. So just know as a parent, it's a great opportunity for a student to grow through getting a B. And it might be their first B ever. That's okay. They can learn from that. There's usually always a second chance to like improve that grade, you know, and don't don't give up. A lot of times people who are used to getting A's, they get their first B or a C and then they throw on the towel and they're like, I'm done with this. Like, if I can't get an A, I might as well not even try. I see it a lot. And so don't let that happen to you guys as students. And try not to you know, try to encourage that not happening with your son or daughter. Because it's people have stigmatized a C or a B to being a bad thing. A means outstanding, excellent, you have mastered this material. You probably shouldn't have mastered the material in your classes by now. You've only been in there for a couple months. Like By the end of the semester, hopefully you've shown mastery, you've shown effort. So great, if you have an A, that's great, you're doing your work, you're getting stuff done. But I think there's going to be a, a, a push at our high school that you'll see, maybe before you guys are out of here, of a higher expectation of learning a more rigorous content expectation where, what is an A? What does that mean? Is an A something that you get just by turning in your work? Or do you actually have to show that you are a master of this subject? So, just be aware, if that starts happening, you start seeing more Bs, it's a conversation to have, but it's not like a life-threatening situation where we call in you know, the special forces and like break down the doors of the school and ask what's going on. Okay, so just know that that's okay. I'm perfectly fine with that. Job number two, get yourself involved in something. Okay, I'll talk about community service briefly. I've got to hurry up. Um, but get involved in something that you're passionate about. Don't do it because there's a community service requirement. Do it because you like to do something fun that helps other people. 
It could be a sport. It could be volunteering at a dog shelter. It could be doing the Ironman. Because, you know, as freshman, you're going to have six hours, sophomores, eight hours. That's minimum. And that's not very much. Most schools, like as seniors, there's schools that I've seen that have 50 to 100 hours required in their senior year alone of community service. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to, to experience new things. Who knows? Maybe you go volunteer at you know, the Pet Network and you find out you want to be a vet. Like, it's a great learning opportunity for students. So encourage, you know, encourage yourself, encourage your son or daughter to get out there and just dive into stuff. And we do have a lot of students that are doing a ton of different things. And you know, that's a great thing about a small school. Everyone plays every sport. And so, you know, people are busy, but there's always a little bit of time to, you know, like an hour on a Saturday to do something like that can give back. And record it. Keep it. That's all good stuff for college applications. Again, make an appointment with me. All freshmen, you haven't got on it yet. I will get on it, get you on it as soon as I'm physically possible to do so. This program called Navians, called Navians Family Connection. And it's a new program that we've, we're rolling out slowly throughout this next year to all of our students. It's a great tool for you guys to use. Um, if I have some more time after questions, I'll give a little bit more, more explanation. Um, but essentially, it's a great college, career, research, collaboration, um, application, do-it-all type tool. There's a career interest inventory that when we get on it, all you freshmen, that I'll have you guys go through. It gives some really good career information, um, huge opportunity to search for different, uh, like very specific jobs. You know, petrochemical engineer, like there's a description of that, like in pretty deep detail, what's required, how much they make, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's pretty cool. Start researching colleges. It's never too early to start. Um, you're not making decisions. You're not choosing where you're going right now. So don't say, I'm going to Cal. We don't know that yet. Yeah, it's a great goal. It's a great thing to figure out, but just start looking at it. It's okay to add stuff to your list. Take stuff off your list, too. If you, you know, when you guys go on vacations for your families, if you're driving through LA, visit a college. Take 30 or 40 minutes and just stop and go somewhere. Look something up on your route to wherever you're heading. The best way to look at colleges is to actually step on campus. Because you can look at all the pretty pictures that they take and like strategically place on you know, their website. But it could be a type of thing where you're looking at this beautiful, picturesque mountain college and you turn around and it is like Compton and horrible and not fun to be at. <laughs> there, no joke, I mean, you go to USC, go to UCLA, like all those schools like are not in super great areas, but they're beautiful campuses. So it's, it really makes a great difference to show up. It doesn't have to be in session. You don't have to have a tour. It's recommended to take a tour if you can. But just walk around. Look at the people that are there. Look at some of the classrooms. Look at the dining commons, dorms, that kind of stuff. Those are great research tools that are above and beyond what you can do on a website. And it doesn't have to be a college you've already heard of. You drive through, uh, I can't think of the top of my head. Some are different. And you find, you know, colleges in this area. Look what up and just go. Sometimes the best colleges that people find are the ones that they've never even heard of because it fits you the best. It's not this brand name that you hear. There's, you know, 6,000 colleges in the United States. There's one that's specifically tailored for you, I promise. Parents start saving money. Um, it's expensive. Uh, well, you know, there's different creative ways to do that. I am not a financial aid expert. So I can help you fill out boxes, check this box, fill in this number here. But like if you're divorced and have five homes and three boats and like an annuity for your dog, that's like a much more specialized person than me. And it's usually worth the money to spend to talk to a financial aid expert or financial advisor if you're like in that situation where you have a lot of different stuff going on. Because more than likely they will save you 10 times the amount of the fee that, that you pay them by helping you figure out how to lower your expected family contribution. I can provide resources, referrals to certain people in our area. There's one guy that's really good named Jeff Davison. He, he knows his way in and out of taxes and you know, 401ks and all this stuff. So he's a great resource. It does cost money, so all these all those outside services are typically for cost, but usually they save you money in the long run. Uh, sign up, take the plan test, freshman. Uh, the plan test is going to be tentatively up December 12th. I'll show that again later. Um, that's a good test. It's a practice ACT. So there's a couple practice tests that freshmen and sophomores take, the plan and the PSAT. Yeah, I'll touch. I'll, it's up, it'll be up here. 
It was just on that slide too. Maintaining your grades, so this is sophomores now, 10th graders, time to tune in. Um, so your, your job is still to be the student. There's not a whole lot else to this yet. Okay? You're getting good grades, you're getting involved, you're taking challenging classes. Don't let an F, don't let an oops, become a landslide. Sometimes students will get an F, and again, throw in that towel, and I've seen it before, you know, A's, B's, A's, B's, A's, B's, one F in English or something, and all of a sudden, F's, D's, C's. Like, it, don't let it crush your ability to learn. One mistake is not gonna kill you. We have credits built into our graduation requirements. You have the ability to retake classes if you fail them for that exact reason. We don't expect you all to be perfect. We realize that you guys are not. We're not perfect at school either, you know, we make mistakes occasionally, we try to catch them, but, um, you know, everyone's entitled to a little bit of real life. So don't, don't crush yourself if you don't live up to the expectation that you put out for yourself, okay? Again, get involved, challenge yourself in more, step up your, your, your class level. So if you're in, in non-honors English in freshman year, and you do pretty well, you can go into honors English your sophomore year. It'll be harder, it'll be more challenging, but if you're acing honors English, or regular, your non-honors English, it's not regular, that tells me that you're probably ready for the next level, and that it's, a, it's time to maybe step it up a little bit. So think about doing that. And families have that talk. You know, say, you know, how much, how much effort, how much time are we willing to contribute to this? Take the PSAT. Every sophomore this year, and I'm hoping in the future years, every sophomore this year will be taking the PSAT, no matter if you want to or not. Yes, so that's October 16th. Yep. Thank you, TTUSD. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Rob Leary. So thanks, thank Rob. Do we need to sign them up for it? Nope. I've already ordered the tests. So there's a couple of reasons why I do this in 15 seconds. One is there's a program within the PSAT called AP Potential, which essentially looks at their results, they statistically analyze it, and they give us a probability that, uh, and a list of students in terms of like specific AP classes that based on your ability level on the PSAT, you are statistically probable to be successful at an AP test, as meaning scoring a three or higher in X amount of classes. And so we use those those results to try to encourage students. Like, you know, hey, you have an ability in psychology. Why don't you challenge yourself and take the AP psychology class? Mainly it is to get kind of underrepresented uh, populations within AP classes because it is typically a very broad divide. Um, possibly a little bit less so here, but in certain classes. So it's encouraging students and it also helps us see where students are at. One, that's one of the main reasons. And we did it last year, and I, I was able to help some students get to certain AP classes because they took it. But typically, our AP class students are the ones that do take the test. So it doesn't really do a whole lot if we just test our AP students. So we wanted to test everybody. It's a good experience for everyone to be a part of that test, even if they're not going to college. It's a good life experience. So that's one of the main reasons why I love to do that. One question about the PSAT. Does the PSAT get reported to colleges at all? Or no, so PSAT information comes back to me and you. So I get a report for our school, and I get all of your individual reports that I store with me, and I give you guys a report. So it doesn't go to colleges, you don't have to worry about reporting anything, no one ever sees this stuff. It's strictly practice, it's informational for you. Okay. The only year that does get reported to somebody, it's not to colleges, is your 11th grade year when you get entered into the National Merit Scholarship competition. You've got to score pretty dang, pretty dang high up there to like really make that matter. Um, it's very rare for anybody from any most schools. I mean, there's I think 10,000 people in the entire state that becomes a, like a semifinalist, and then I don't know how many finalists there are, but it's you've got to basically almost have a perfect score in your PSAT to kind of qualify for that type of thing. Um, yeah. So if you're that student, let's talk because that's really good. <laughs> Does that test happen during class time? Yes. So it happens the morning of Wednesday, October 16th. So it'll be in here, it'll be in the computer lab, it'll be a 
big undertaking. Uh, scholarships, uh, it's not really like you're going to find a whole lot of stuff for scholarships. There's a few here and there that you might be able to poke your head into. Typically, scholarships happen about halfway through your senior year for the ones that you're actually probably going to get. The other ones are more big, giant, Dr. Pepper type scholarships that you see the guy throwing the ball football game with a hundred thousand dollar check. Those are scholarship, or uh, those are like sweepstakes. So that's essentially what it is. They're market. They want marketing material to send you junk mail, and they give a hundred thousand dollars to one lucky person. Who signs that? Uh, again, stopping and traveling, and then starting a binder, starting a, a way to track information. Okay, keep track of it. If you go to college, get materials, put it in a spot in a binder. Just create a huge resource because when you go back and you start actually like making decisions for your life, you'll have a bunch of notes about, you know, I didn't like this campus. It was too out in the middle of nowhere, or there wasn't very many trees, or the professors were mean, that kind of stuff. Those are all good things to come to make decisions with. One to two, and I promise I'm almost finished. So one to two, I stole, borrowed, kind of, uh, from, I started at Cal Poly. I actually was an aerospace engineer. Believe it or not, not I never worked in, in industry, but I was. I studied aerospace engineering for several years at Cal Poly. It was not my calling. I got into the actual coursework. It was not as much fun as I thought it was going to be. I way over dramatized it. Um, I thought it was going to be like this cool guy designing rockets and stuff, and it wasn't. But anyways, their program. Um, it's a lot of math and physics. Um, their program that they had was 25 to 35. So they did it on the week scale. And that's at a college level. So that they, their expectation was that you study outside of lab, outside of class, minimum 25 to 35 hours every week. Some of you might be thinking, that's almost a full-time job. It is. It's, you know, 35 hours is five less than a typical full-time job. Remember what we said? Your number one job is being a student. So this is a pared down version. And this is minimum. So like one to two hours every day, every night of the week, sometimes on a Saturday. And that's a bare minimum. So if you're not doing one to two hours, the likelihood of being successful and doing good work at a high, like a successful high school, high school level is way diminished. The average high school student studies 19 minutes every night for all their classes. And that's the average, that means people do more. It also means people do less. So I think I like to think that our students are pretty good at doing the one to two. You know, they are already kind of do that, but it's got to be kind of a um, a habit that you get into, and it becomes easier. The beginning will be pretty bad. You won't like it, and it might be bad for you, the parent, because you're kind of helping be the you know the facilitator of this. But just like going to the gym, or just like you know going through how we get practice. The first couple weeks suck, and then it gets much better, and it becomes this routine that you're used to, and you see results. So, one to two does not mean only homework. So students should never have the opportunity to come home and say, I'm done, I did everything at school. No. They have a ton of stuff to do. And by looking at grades, a lot of students are not doing it. I'm seeing tons of missing work, I'm seeing tons of low test scores, that tells me that one, you're not doing your homework like you say you are, and two, you're not studying for tests. Or you're saying you're studying, but you're really like looking at the book, texting, looking at the book, you know, YouTube, that kind of stuff. Who, who, who sees that at home sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, we see it here sometimes too. We try to you know, nick it in the butt. But, so they never have an excuse not to do something. They can't do homework. Homework is a very valid thing to do. Um, a lot of times students have opportunities at school to do that. There's an RTI period that's a great opportunity to get at least an hour a weekend. There's after school tutoring, there's lunch. All those times are a great time to get support. But there's things like, I mean, going back and reviewing the textbook. That's like an old school thing, I think. No one does that anymore. So like opening up the textbook or the chapter you just finished and going to the back of that chapter, there's questions, there's answers, there's like review things that you can go through. All those things are great things to do with your 30 minutes that you have after getting homework. Working as a group, put together a study group. If you have friends, it's much more fun to study with other people. 
if you're purposeful. You can't study and chit chat the whole time. You have to study and like share ideas and like answer questions for each other or quiz each other. All those things are great. And, it, and sometimes people learn better that way. You know, practicing for a quiz, working on a project, doing a community service. All those things are great ways to do one to two. And all of them will pay off big time on your grades, on your success levels, and your stress levels. People are stressed because they're worried about their classes and they're worried about their homework. Okay, that's the number one big stress thing in high school. If you do your one to two, and you do it regularly and do it well, you don't have to worry about your classes. You're done, like you're getting the work done. Your stress level goes way down. Because you got A's, you got your goals that you're wanting to meet, okay? So that's, that's why when you hear teachers say, are you doing one to two? If I walk down the hallway and say, how's your one to two doing? I don't want to hear, great. I would like to hear, this is what I'm doing for my one to two. You know, I, I, I read half of my book last night, okay? So great doesn't really cut it with me, neither does I don't know. Okay, so as parents too, just side tidbit, don't accept I don't know. That's a horrible answer. Okay. That's typically, that's become kind of a go-to answer. And, and everyone's guilty of it. I, I admit myself, there's times when I say I don't know. So it's okay. But try to dig deeper. Ask them, what, well, what do you know? Like, what do you think? What's your best guess? How do you, how, what would you do if you had to choose this very second how you would answer this question, what steps would you take? If they don't know, there's some bigger issues probably to talk about. Okay, So that just help them be critical thinkers by, ask, by not accepting that one simple answer and giving, okay, here's the answer. Okay, so just, it, it builds their process. All right, plan and PSAT, quickly. I'm running out of time very quickly, too. Um, PSAT is for sophomores and juniors, okay? That's who we test at our school. Um, again, PSAT, free for the 10th graders. Every 10th grader will take it. It's $15 for juniors. So next year, if you're a 10th grader, unless the district ponies up more money, um, it'll be 15 bucks. That's just because that's about how much it costs. Um, it is a very valuable tool. Uh, one of the best ways to get practice with the, the college entrance examination testing environment is actually sitting in there and doing it. You 10th graders, if you didn't do the plan, la plan last year, if you did that, that's kind of a good initiator too. The friend, some of the guys that didn't do that though, when I give that test, about halfway through, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing here? Because it's a long time. You're sitting there for three and a half hours, just like the SAT. And if, you, if we don't know how to do that, you're gonna be experiencing that for the first time when you're paying 50, 60 bucks for the SAT when the scores actually matter. So sitting that long is part of the experience, getting experience within that environment. The plan test, so the PSAT is for the SAT, the plan is for the ACT, and it, it, the plan is for the ninth and 10th graders, so it's a little bit less, and it's become, it's normed differently, meaning it's, it's designed for different grade levels. Yes? Can you take the PSAT as a sophomore? <clears throat> Excuse me, can you take the Juniors take the SAT then, or? So yes, the, the typical way to do it would be juniors would take the PSAT in the fall, start taking the SAT in the spring. Um, so yeah, you can take the SAT as many times as you want. It gets expensive, it gets tiresome. Typically they do best towards the middle end of their junior, junior year and start. You know, two or three times their junior year, once or twice their senior year in the fall, early fall. That's usually about as many times as most students take. You can take it as many times as it's offered. Well, on average, you kind of reach a plateau typically of like your kind of typical score. It'll fluctuate, but um, taking it a million times doesn't usually pay off too, too much. Yes? If you take it multiple times, do you only have to report your best score or do you have to report all of them? So when you report scores, all of your previous scores go with it. They're included in the same report. So every time you report a score, your previous scores go with it. School, schools typically will only pay attention to your major scores. And you only, you know, you'll, you report most of the time when you apply to colleges, they'll ask you for all the, school, all the times you took the test and all your scores. They really want to know your highest score. And then some schools do what's called super scoring. And they'll take your highest score from each subsection and add it up. Which can serve you well, 
Sometimes it hurts you. Because what if that one guy did super good this time in English and super good, you know, not so hot in math, but then flip flop it the next time? You know, sometimes some people might say, oh, focus on one section. Uh, I, don't, I don't really buy into that. Um, but I mean, it, it, there's, it's, it's not always like a yes or no, black or white type answer. But yes, it, all the answers, all your previous test uh, attempts go with it. And they usually, they'll take your highest one usually. Uh, so the plan is the PS, like the PSAT for the ACT. Um, again, planning on December 12th. Um, that's what's on my calendar. There's not a specific, I get to set the date for that one. The PSAT is a specific date that the college board gives me. The plan is more flexible. So that's just the date that I've chosen at this point. I haven't nailed it down exactly yet, but just to give you a heads up, it's, it'll be sometime in that general vicinity. Uh, there's no scholarship opportunity for that. Um, it'll get us for freshmen and sophomores. Community service. This is brand new this year. Board policy, meaning it's district-wide. I got this handed to me the first day I was back. And not a very good kind of, it was like my paper said draft. So. There's still a lot of questions that people are asking me that I don't necessarily have answers to, or I have a good guess, but it's, we're kind of having to roll this out and figure out how it works as we go. So it might take some patience. We're not super strict, like we're pretty flexible with most things. If you have questions about an activity that you're doing, please let me know, um, or ask your Pathways teacher. So everything is run through your Pathways class, so the kind of system of operations is that you all should have gotten packets of community service information, in the back there are some forms. One is a pre-authorization form, for lack of a better word, that you fill out, basically, the parents saying this is okay for my, my kid to do, the school saying this is okay to do for community service. That gets turned in before, it asks you a few other questions. Once that's complete, you go do the community service. There's a log sheet on the next page of that packet. Um, there's also a bunch of packets in the office of the Career Council, the Council College Center that you can pick up if you need more, if you lost it, don't have one. But that log sheet is how you actually log your hours. So you write in your activity, the amount of time you did it for, and get a signature by the person supervising you. Typically, the person should not be a parent. Sometimes it works out that way. We're not really worried about it, but like, you can't go like mow your uncle's lawn for community service. It doesn't count. It's gotta be something serving the entire community, usually with a, like an organization of some sort. Um, freshman, six years. So 30 years total for freshmen, or 30 wow. years. <laughs> yes, we're indentured servanthood. Yeah. Uh, so 30 hours total by the time you graduate. However, there is a requirement, you will not pass your pathways class without doing the minimum amount each year. So some questions have been posed, can I do my 30 hours and get it all out of the way? You can do 30 hours, but it only can. You have to do eight hours each subsequent year if you're a freshman. So it's not bad to do above and beyond what this minimum requirement is. But you do have to do the amount required every year to path your, pass your pathways class. And that class is a pass-fail, two credits, one per semester. So it's great if you do get behind in like elective credits, so it gives you an opportunity to get caught up a little bit. But it does affect like academic eligibility, stuff like that. Okay, so if you get an F, it's a pass with a P or an F with an F. Just like a regular F in another class. Not as important for like colleges, but it can affect a lot of things. Um, again, it must be approved, and then, you know, when you do something, you're going to work with your Pathways teacher. That's who all of your forms will go to. They will update the document for me, and then at the end of each year, I verify the numbers, keep track of everyone's, like, overall goals. You know, for seniors, if they don't get certain amounts, they don't graduate. So that's kind of my not very much fun job. Hopefully we don't have to address um, as people not completing their hours. Uh, two questions. Um, so on the pathways grade, so say you have to do eight hours by June. Um, if you get grade in January, like say you have to put in zero hours between now and January, and then you're going to do it all in the spring or something. Right. Like so um, the quick answer to that is it does, as long as you have it by the end of the year. So you have you will get a grade a one credit pass fail grade in January. But you won't have to have you don't you don't have to have like four and four or three and three or anything like that. As long as you have by the June grade, that'll be what determines your you know if you don't have it by June, by the time that school's out, then it's an F. But if you don't have it by January, that's fine. Hopefully, you're making progress towards that goal uh, throughout the year. 
I, would, I wouldn't necessarily say, but it's, it's kind of an ongoing process. Like, I would, I would recommend it's a better experience to kind of spread it out. Don't just, like, bust it out in one day. Like, that's, it's not cheating, but it's kind of, it kind of cheats you a little bit of some of the experience uh, of, like, an ongoing volunteer opportunity. Good question. That was another hand. So we don't accept anything, it's, if you did something during the summer and it's like, falls within the guidelines and like you can get someone to sign off on it, run it by us. We kind of would like you to do hours during the school year. Anything before summer is no-go. We won't accept if you did it in the spring last year, that's like taking it last year. It's this, it's each school year. Yeah, so if they did it, we've been, we've been working, I mean they've had the form since the beginning of the year, so. Um, they can go back and, and, you know, if you filled it out and you, you did it, you know, you volunteered with boosters or something like that. You can go back. You just have to make sure that you, someone has to sign off on it. It can't be you. It's got to be that person who supervises you about this activity. Um, I'm going to keep going for one sec. Uh, transcripts, essentially, oh, we got to move it up. So this here, just in a quick five minute, five minute long. This is your GPA area. That's where that overall accumulative GPA lies. This is the printout that I have. When you go on Aries, it looks a little bit different, but you can access a lot of the same information. Uh, it has your class rank. As you get higher and higher, your, your grade will differentiate more. And there are ties. So if like three people have 4.0s exactly, it would be like 1, 1, 1, 4. Okay? Uh, becomes more important as you get higher in school and looking at college and stuff. It's got your CASI status. So I'm testing retakers t today. Tomorrow, um, your high school exit examination. This is another requirement for getting a graduation diploma. You have to pass this test. You start taking this your to sophomore year. So you sophomores, in the spring, in February, there is a two-day test that every sophomore does. If you don't make it that day, you come back and do retakes and this kind of stuff. But it, it's typically, most students have no problem with this test. It's not something to be stressed about. It is something that you have to take. Most of our kind of Students that have a little bit harder time are typically English language learners because of the English portion of the test. Most people pass for the first time, no problem. This side here is your credit summary. This far left column is the class names that we require. For, this is graduation, this is in college. The next column is your course required. How many credits do you require in each of these areas? The next column, kind of this middle one here, is how many you've completed so far. It doesn't include any in progress grades. So, like, your freshman, it'll say nothing. Um, and then this last one here is how many credits do you need? How many do you need to finish before you're ready to graduate? By taking six classes every year, you'll get more credits than you need to graduate. If you're college prep, though, you know, sometimes that's how people like have unscheduled periods and that kind of stuff. If you're a college prep type student, if you're going to like a pretty challenging class, you know, college university, you need to take five, six classes every year, even if you have no more requirements for high school credit. They don't like to see people kind of slacking off. Um, and you know, you can maybe do stuff like at Sierra College, which I will remember to address. Uh, I'm not gonna do this. Family connection, I'm not gonna really cover this. Just know that freshmen, you'll be getting on it. Sophomores, you should have an account. If you don't, you need to see me if you're new. You won't have gotten it. I gave it to him last year, at the end of the year. Um, but again, it's a process. I gotta be able to pull all the freshmen together into the computer lab and library and that kind of stuff. It just has that yet. Um, there is an SAT prep program in there that you can, you know, it's here for this year. I don't know if it's going to come back or not. Um, it's called Prep Me. Normally it's like 300 bucks each. So it's a very valuable tool. Um, gives you practice tests, ideas. It's, it's a pretty good program. Um, you can access that by logging in. It's kind of in your top left hand corner when you get in there. Um, probably more applicable to the sophomore class. Freshman, it's it might be a little bit above some of your abilities at this point. Um, because the SAT is a junior, senior type stuff, they're teaching you SAT level stuff. So it's not a bad thing, but just know that it's probably pretty hard for you. Um, so I'll, I will answer questions after I talk about Sierra College for just a second. And we are at seven, I have two minutes on my watch. Um, so I'm doing pretty good. So again, guys, after I answer this question, I am done. So if you don't want to stay for questions, that's fine. You're not going to make me feel bad if you get up and leave. I know people have stuff to do. But I'll stay and answer questions for, you know, a decent amount of time. I won't stay all night. But um, 
if you have questions that you want to ask as a whole, I'll answer questions as a whole until people start kind of filtering out. That tells me that you're done. And then if you want to stay and ask more individual questions, I'll stay for a little while too. But in terms of Sierra College, and some people do take Sierra College classes. Typically it's in the English um, areas. Um, and it's your junior and senior year. So they, there's some positive and negatives um, about both sides of the about taking it here in the AP system and also taking it at Sierra College. So positive is about both. Our, our, school, our system here is a very good system. Our AP English teachers are pretty good. Um, we are on a year-long schedule. Students have consistent long-term access to an English curriculum. Sierra College is on a semester system. So you're fitting a year's worth of material, which is a positive on your part too if you want to think about it, but you're fitting a year's worth of material into essentially two and a half months. At a college level, at college expectations, you miss class once a week, like you meet like once a week usually, you miss one class, that's like missing a week and a half. So there help, there, there's no exceptions made for our school. I don't have any like, hey, they were gone, like, can you please just make an exception this one time? I think there's professors who probably laugh at me. So there's it's, it's much more kind of a harsh, it's not bad environment, but it's much stricter. There's not exceptions like we can sometimes do here. Um, it is weighted at the college, so it's just like an AP class here, the same equivalency. Um, if you pass that class, it does transfer to, you know, as long as it transfers to the school that you're looking at, which you'd have to talk to Sierra College about, um, most, of the, most of the English classes that you take are definitely UC and CSU transferable. Um, they have an agreement, but in terms of like privates or any other schools, you have to check with that individual school. But as long as you pass that class, you can transfer that course to a four-year school. Here at the campus, if you take AP, you get your GPA, you get your bonus points, that kind of stuff, you get your year-long classes. To get college credit, you do have to pass the AP test. Typically with a three or better. Sometimes a four out of five. Okay, uh, there's so essentially like AP English language, your eleventh grade English here. That's first semester of college English, freshman English. AP English literature is like second semester. So by passing both those classes, or by taking English one A and one B at Sierra College, you're filling your freshman college English requirements. Uh, the other thing I'll say about Sierra College as a negative is about that time spent in the classroom. So you could hypothetically have, you know, you could take English 1A in the fall and the class fills up for English 1B in the spring. And they don't offer it in the summer. So you can hypothet hypothetically be an entire year without any English curriculum at all before you're able to take the next level of English. And English is kind of like a math, kind of like a language where it, well, it is a language. Uh, it's getting late. Uh, where it takes practice, it takes consistency to be to grow and to maintain that level of knowledge that's to be expected of you. And so, I mean, those are definitely risks that you take by taking classes at the Sierra, at the Sierra College level. Um, it's a dollar a unit. You have to buy a book typically, and you have to get up there. So most most of the time, students will have an off period if they're you know. Usually junior or seniors are the only ones that are able to take it. Uh, they usually have an off period and they go up there once a week. It's usually in the evenings. So if you're playing sports, it's usually a challenge. Um, they, they, the classes range from like 2.30 start time to 6 o'clock start time going until 9 o'clock at night. So I mean, it very much varies widely. Um, we are kind of last on the totem pole in terms of getting spots. They enroll their students first. Anything left, we're able to get. So far, we haven't had anybody not able to get in um, to an English class. You can take history there too, it's much less common. Um, the same type of thing applies. Yes. I was actually thinking more of summertime, not during the school year. I've heard that some of the top, like higher performing students some of them have do that. taken during the summer. I wasn't thinking during, during the, the school year. So, yeah, many of you do like, take during the school year. During the summer, summer is definitely an option too. But again, we're, we're, we're placing bets on that they're going to be not full that they're going to offer the class when we want to take it, that it's a night that we can do it. Like, there's a lot of ifs involved with taking classes up there. It's a great option, don't get me wrong. A lot of people do it and they're very successful. 
But again, I'm curious about how they're going to do the next summer after they've been off of English for an entire year. And so, you know, some very different things to weigh, and it's probably more of an individual, this is my student's style type of question than a blanket statement that this is a good option or a bad option. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Like as a whole group level, yes? Do you, um, do you see in CSU look at your GPA from just your A through G courses? Yes. So they actually calculate their own GPA. So basically, when you apply, this is a long way down the road for you guys, but when you apply, and hopefully, you know, stuff changes. I mean, we just got a brand new common application. Um, so, I mean, it's, it could be a year-to-year -year thing. So, I mean, as long as nothing changes in the future, um, they, you, when you apply, you, you list the classes you've taken within the A through G courses that we have that are on that website and they have on their application. You list the grades that you got in those classes. And you, you also do a GPA that's on your transcript. But they really they calculate their GPA, your GPA. So they recalculate it based on your A through G um, grades, and so that way they can compare it. Because that that also makes it more comparable.